This is episode 49 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Welcome to episode 49 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today, I have George Duby on the show, and George is an accountant that is a real estate investor with over 80 doors plus a whole bunch of storage units. Uh, I had him on the show today and basically grilled him with questions about accounting for real estate investors. I asked him all about his portfolio, uh, and I even took questions from my Instagram followers, and I posed those questions to him, which was a pretty cool thing I haven't had a chance to do on this show yet. So you're absolutely gonna love this episode if you are a Canadian real estate investor, looking to understand this market better, understand your options better, uh, and know the things that you should at least be asking your accountant about. I really enjoyed this episode and I know you're gonna like it too. Without further ado, please enjoy episode 49 with George Duby. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I have George Duby on the show, real estate investor extraordinaire, accountant extraordinaire, and a uh, guy that's gonna teach us a lot. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. George, thanks for making the trip over. Oh, very happy to be here and looking forward to a, a, a very avid fan of the uh, the program and uh, haven't had the opportunity to be on this side of the table. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you're here. I know we, we, we spoke about this. I ran into you at an event and you uh, you liked the length of the episodes for your long runs. Yes, so. yeah. It was uh, often I find that there's a variety of 20 minute programs and not that those aren't wonderful. I'm not trying yeah. to, to cut those, but it was nice for a little bit longer runs to be able yeah. to, uh, to hear something going on and um, a little different. You want to be able to get 10K in before the episode's yes, done. Yes, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> is that your normal normal run length? Um, I, I won't say it's normal because at times I, I was up ab above uh, 30. Holy. And, uh, but then I found it was hard on the knee. So then I went back down. And so I go up and down. But it, probably in an ideal, I'd be, say, a half marathon. You run a half marathon how many times? Like in I was. Again, I haven't done it for a little bit because of my knee. Oh, okay. But, um, I had, say, in August, ran five of them or something to that effect. Five half marathons. Yes. That's incredible. It was something I never expected. Never, never expected. Well, why did you start doing that? That's a longer answer, probably. But I was just trying to, for lack of a better word, go back to a little bit of running. And don't get me wrong, I've never been a serious runner. But uh, I, I don't know, I'm going to call it 10-ish years ago, Robin and I would do a little bit of running. But it was usually, let's say, 5K. And anyway, so I decided at one point, it'd be nice to be able to say you ran a marathon. And, and, and I have zero desire to actually go to a formal marathon. And I just want to be able to say I ran that distance, if you yeah. will. And anyway, so I got myself up through the last, uh, over the, the summer and uh, ultimately got to the, as I said, uh, just over 30K um, and did that uh, five or six times, I think, in August. And um, now I tailed back a bit and now going again. Wow. I, I've never heard of anyone running half marathons with regularity. I, I've heard of, you know, you, you come up to that every once in a while, but maybe that was a problem with the knee. It wasn't a great idea. <laughs> well, you know, congratulations to you. That's, a, that's amazing. So yeah, it gives me a little something to shoot for. I've been just doing my little 3K runs now. I'm up to 3K. Yes. <laughs> but I want to maintain that uh, five minute per kilometer or less. And then just build it up into like five kilometers and then just try and get that time down close to 20 minutes and right. give me a good cardio workout, but still can be done inside of, you know, 25 minutes. So, and I was slow, no question, but yeah, it, it was fun. Yeah. And, what kind? and I would, if I'm listening to the podcast now, again, that was something, okay. It doesn't feel like it's for the lack of a better word, dead time. If you yeah. will, I, I'm learning. Yeah. It's good for the body. Yeah. Um, and not, strictly not that there's anything wrong with listening to music and i found if i as, as i got a little bit further into it i need a little bit more of a pick-me-up so, yeah, so you throw some music again on. yes yeah. it'd be nice to yeah that first hour was a lot easier than the second hour for oh, example wow. that's incredible i struggle with 10 minutes <laughs> <laughs> well i started off really really slow it was more walking than anything yeah so i uh, i'll do i'll do some music but then on audiobooks too you know occasionally a podcast but it's yeah it's a little mix of stuff just to uh um uh, you know just to keep it light but uh, anyways, George, you're the guy that everybody knows uh, wearing the bow tie, which is unfortunate because I don't think we have it in the shot, uh, <laughs> but you're always well dressed and um, you're always uh, putting solutions together for people. Uh, what I loved about this episode is 
I, I'm very adamant that this stays a true real estate investor podcast. And I wanted to have an accountant on, but it had to be a real estate investor. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just chatting with you and in passing. And I think you said you're over 80 doors. Yes, that's what uh, Robin tells me. Uh, Robin's my wife. And uh, that, and then we have, um, I don't know, a couple hundred storage units and things of that nature. Oh, amazing. Okay, we're going to have to talk all about storage units today. Um, we have we have a, a, an action-packed show. So this show <laughs> is going to feature accounting questions that uh, I've, I've posted a, a post on, on Instagram for people to ask questions and I'm going to ask George on the show. So we're going to do that. And, uh, and of course, we're going to talk about your real estate portfolio to start things off, where that started, where your motivation came from. So um, if you don't mind, let's just start there. Tell me a little bit about your journey in real estate investing. The journey began actually completely by accident. And it really was something where I needed an office for the accounting firm. Uh, we were growing too fast. We, could, we were, I was subleasing space with another accountant and he was growing as well. And well, he, he was the, I was subletting from him. So it was clear who was moving. And we, at that time, I couldn't afford, um, uh, by myself a building, if you will. My brother-in-law needed some place to live. And so we made a deal basically, okay, we'll split the building. And I would have the accounting firm on the lower level. And he, with his wife, were living in the upper level. Actually, I guess there's three levels. And so yeah, uh, the accounting firm also had the, the what I'll call the attic. But he was also working with me at the time. So, so it made it nice. The problem was, again, we were growing so fast. So we ended up kicking him and his wife out. Um, and after about a year, we found before we did that process, we were able to get into the property. We, we did a lot of work, work ourselves in, in terms of trying to fix it up. It had been an absentee landlord that had the property and uh, several not-for-profit organizations within this older house. Victorian house. And we realized we picked it up relatively inexpensively because I thought it was funny, but the owner at the time was hollering across at his neighbor when it was for sale, what he was willing to accept for the price. And my brother-in-law happened to be walking across the front sidewalk right at that moment in time. So we knew exactly what we needed to do, bought it and realized that the property value probably increased 50 grand or so really quickly just by a little bit of lipstick and rouge. And we did that over a month or two. And then we realized, wait a minute, if you can do it once, you have to be able to do it twice. And if you can do it twice, you can do it four times, etc. Yeah. Um, now, it wasn't us doing all the work for those by any means, but the concept was there. And how long ago was that? That would have been, I'm going to call it 19 years ago. Okay. Um, and the only because I remember the first year having my daughter, who was in diapers at the time, sitting on my boardroom table. And there's a, a Christmas picture uh, of her sitting there with uh, me and um, she's 19 now. So. Yeah. Okay. So it's been, it's been a little while yes. and then you got started then. So uh, it was a mixed use building, I'm guessing, the commercial on the main. Correct. Which allowed you to run your office out of there, accounting. That's right. And then upstairs you had somebody else living. Well, so it was your yes. brother-in-law. Brother-in-law. That's right. Okay. And then you kicked him out. Yes. You use Roughly. that for office. <laughs> you use that for office space too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so just expansion for offices and. Stuff. And then the nice part, I mean, when we kicked him out, is then we got into a a property that was actually it was a fiveplex at that point. So he and his wife lived in one of the units, and we took the other four and we condoed those. Uh, so again, something different. So we were we were definitely insane. He was kicked out as a very friendly kick out, yeah. And he still had half the profit. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So it, it all it all worked out. Um, were you applying what uh, what they now call as a burr, where you were going in and refinancing and using that money towards future purchases? We did not at the time. We appreciated the, the increase in value, but if you will, wasn't that sophisticated and not realizing that it was really a real estate investor at the time. I thought it was more so I was looking for space for an office. And, and so we didn't set up the financing properly to make a long story short to be able to do that. So over a period of time, yes, that's exactly what we did, but we should have had a much shorter period of time of financing initially. So you could have grown it faster had you had you uh, planned it accordingly? Knowing today what I know, yes, it would have yeah. been much faster. Are you still, well, okay, so, so many questions. 
uh, classic. Uh, are you still looking to grow aggressively? Or are you more at the let's just manage what we have stage? I don't know that I would say I would be trying to grow aggressively, but I'm certainly not content with what I have. Okay. The, the, I have, I'm confident all I need, but now it's starting to buy for different charities and, and your kids and things. I, I want to be able to coach. I, I have a nephew that I want to be able to coach. So, and, and it's still, I love doing it, but I don't necessarily need it for the financial aspect. To it. Right. So as far as whenever you're ready to, to say no more accounting, you've got the properties there, they can take care of what you need in, in retirement. Yes. And, and part of my theory, rightly or wrong, I mean, I love what I do from the accounting side. I mean, well, I love talking to clients. I love doing presentations and what, had, had a... Uh, meeting with my boss this morning, just he said, what's your utopia? And so I described that to him and I said, everything that involves administration or actual work, no, somebody else can take care of that. I want to be there when there's, there's problem, there's opportunities, there's planning to be done. And I want to be the person on stage. I want to be able to talk to people. That's my utopia. The idea guy. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I can completely relate to that because I do not like the, the administration don't get me wrong. I treat it kind of like like framing a basement wall. I, I I don't mind doing it if I have a Saturday and a beer and right, right. <laughs> but it, I don't want to do it because I have to. Yes. Yeah. Like it's some some things like building a cool spreadsheet is fun sometimes. It, it, it can be. And again, not to be a smart aleck about it, but if if I'm doing something and I can be sitting at my desk and I've got my beer, I've got my glass of wine or glass of scotch, whatever mm -hmm. it is. I mean, that's a completely different work environment than. Yeah what it would be stereotypical yeah when you're on the clock you know you're nine to five day trying to get trying to get things done so you set up you know that's another whole conversation is is it your company i guess you've you've franchised a, a part of it an existing company it, it, i would more describe so, so beforehand as doobie Catini and some other prior versions before that we we merged in so we're full peter and i are full partners of bdo and so there's roughly speaking 400 of us okay and we have I might have the slight, be slight bit off here, but roughly 140 offices across the country. Mm -hmm. But we, we have different areas of focus and, and there'll be, I have other awesome real estate partners within the firm, but there'll also be partners in completely different industries that um, I, I know barely anything about. And, and so part of our idea is being able to access these different skill sets where it, it, you may not need on a daily basis, for example, an expert in GST or HST or international tax or Aboriginal issues, opportunities. But when we do come across those, it's just fantastic to have the ability to, hey, by the way, we need to talk to Betty Sue or Billy Bob or whoever it may be. And they know a lot more than George does about this particular area. Let's get them on board for this part of the equation. Okay. And, and I just think this is, it's one of those things I've been curious about how, how accounting firms operate this. So, um, are, is there a sort of like you and Peter, you use the BDO name, you are partners overall, but what you guys generate is, is essentially yours. Is it not? No, I, I wouldn't describe it that way at all. So in theory, I am paid just as much whether the partner in Victoria made something or lost something as compared to the partner in Halifax. Right. So it, it is pooled. What oh, okay. will happen, though, is the the equity partners are each year given a certain number of units. Okay. And so then based on various criteria, I may go up or down my units for a particular year. Yeah. And, and clearly, if I'm bringing in more clients, working with more people, helping more offices, that's going to be on the plus side. OK, so well, you get more the more you do. Right. Whereas if I take yeah. two months off or um, yeah. I'm making mistakes or I'm not out in the public and I'm just kind of minding my business, that clearly is not going to be as helpful on unit discussions the following right, year. Right, right. Yeah, they might not want you to be a partner in the uh, in the firm anymore. Yeah, I mean, there's still roles for that. And we, ha yeah. we have different types of partners. And we have a, a, a staff, and we've got some staff that are certainly trying to be a partner. They, they want to be that. And we have staff that have absolutely positively zero desire for it. They, they want to work yeah. maybe not even nine to five. They may want an 80% work week, as an example. Okay. Um, and that's incredibly valuable to us. We, we still get to use their skill sets. We can be more in harmony with what they're trying to do and from, from a work-life balance on their side of things. Yeah. Uh, it, it, everybody wins. Nice. So you're, uh, you're obviously an ambitious guy and, uh, and in intelligent. Um, 
to put all this together. To, so you're building your business um, and you, you're doing quite well with that. I know you've got a fantastic reputation in what you do. Uh, you're building your real estate portfolio the whole time unintentionally, but uh, <laughs> now what it's point, intentional. <laughs> yeah. At what point did you realize, hey, this is this is what what I do. Like I'm an investor now. It would have been within weeks of buying that first office. Oh, okay. So when, when you saw the lift in equity, you're like, whoa, okay, that's yeah, pretty cool. And part, so a couple months prior to that, no, sorry, it'd be a couple months after that now to think about it. Um, I, I was just sick as a dog for a week and couldn't do, I couldn't read because I was dizzy, et cetera, et cetera. So I was watching TV and one of those infomercials comes up where you're going to be the next wealthy tycoon very shortly, as long as you go to the course, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And so once I felt better, went back to the office and uh, I, I made two piles of files on my boardroom table. Those clients that were real estate investors making money, those that were losing money. Okay. Went in, started looking at those, trying to pick up trends, went over to the bookstore at the time and just bought several thousand dollars literally of very, very technical tax, accounting, legal, anything real estate oriented, I pretty much pulled off the shelf. Okay. Um, intentionally went through that, uh, did different courses, was at different meetup groups, talking to people, getting the real reality because in, in accounting or tax 101, you're pretty much taught thou shalt never buy real estate. Thou shalt certainly never put it in a corporation. Yeah. And, and as I'm studying them, they're all wrong. Yeah. Um, no wonder I didn't like real estate beforehand. I didn't know anything about it. Okay. Uh, and so it was getting that the, the professional eyeglasses off, if you will, and really understanding the business. And, and not that I don't think I perfectly understand today. I'm learning something new all the time. But I certainly had a lot more understanding after talking to people, going through for myself, and then applying the tax rules, how I really wanted yeah. to see them done now from a, that practical perspective. And that was that was eye-opening for me. Yeah, the the... The perspective you have on this is insane, you know, coming from from that. And you're right. I think a lot of accountants don't dabble in real estate investing no, um, because they uh, for whatever reason. But I was just so uh, one of my previous guests, second last one. So by the time this airs, it'll be up, Dave. I was speaking with him off camera. And uh, so he, he was a chartered accountant, but then he went into being a realtor and he's a real estate investor. And uh, he said he asked one of his his bosses at one of his firms. Uh, along the way, you know, what's the one commonality? Like you see a lot of people's books, like you see people that are, you know, wealthy among your wealthiest clients. What do you see as being the one consistent thing or a couple of consistent things that they're doing? Any any ideas? And the guy's like, oh, absolutely. 100% real estate's the commonality. And he's like, oh, awesome. So do you own a few properties? No, no, I don't want to get into that. And I just thought that was such a hilarious story because, you know, so many people can see it working and, and being in this business it'd be hard for me to imagine you see it and you you just want to do it. Like I, I know working in mortgages, I would see these people coming to me. Oh yeah, I'm flipping this property. Like this is the lift. I got this much equity in this deal alone. And I did it over the summer. And I'm like, why am I not doing this? Right, right. <laughs> so I guess you kind of had that moment where you you realize like, so a couple of weeks after you really you really dove into it and realized that this is, this is something I need to pursue. It, it was, and I was probably at the time maybe not what I would call board of accounting, but it wasn't providing the same pop that I was looking for. And, and so now the real estate side of things certainly gave me that extra dimension. Um, so would you consider yourself um, real estate focused as a, an accounting um, outfit where you are? Oh, absolutely. So, so in, in my practice, I, I don't know the exact statistic, but uh, I, I, the number that I use rightly or wrongly would be Probably about 75% of my clients are real estate investors, developers, construction industry. And then I'll have another, say, 10, 15% that are the doctors that's also investing in real estate, the engineer, the corner store owner, the the whatever type of person that has another business, whether that was the main business or alternatively, uh, the after the impact business, if you will. So that really Real estate for me is what opens up the door because, as you mentioned, uh, there's a lot of fantastic accountants out there, no, no, no doubt about it. Relatively speaking, few of them are also investing in real estate and, and have that perspective to be able to apply some book smarts and, and actually as well do it what I'll call in-house yeah. as compared to a, a, a lot of the firms will outsource the planning or whatever to um, usually it's Southeast Asia and they don't have that in-house expertise where the nice part about a BDO as an example is 
again, George doesn't have to be able to, or doesn't need to pretend that he's an expert in all of these things. Yeah. I can reach out because I know who is. Yeah, you can find the people, uh, you, you can find the people who are uh, within your own firm, really. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. That's absolutely correct. Okay, so George, I want to get into some of the spe- specifics about your portfolio. So you've got uh, the the first one was a, a mixed use. Do you still have that? I do. I do. Okay, so you kept that. You still operate out of there? No, I don't. Uh, it, it's now strictly residential. But uh, I'm I consider myself a great buyer. I don't consider myself a great seller. Uh, that's way better. So <laughs> for the record, way better. Um, okay, so what's the mix of your portfolio look like? Is it mostly residential mixed? It, it is mostly residential. Um, there, there's some office in there for sure that's dedicated office. I've, I've found I'm not necessarily a, a great office investor. I, I don't know why I haven't had as much success as my residential, for example. Um, but yes, I would say the majority is residential in uh, predominantly, if you will, kind of between St. Catharines and Perry Sound uh, and then a little bit in Alberta. Oh, wow. So Perry Sound, locate me. Isn't that near like Sarnia? Or no, we're, we're going further north. Oh, you're, so, so, you're so up north on... Of, north of Barrie. North around, of Barrie. Around, let's call around Aurelia area. Okay, so you're all into southwestern Ontario up to Aurelia. Yes. Uh, it, pockets. So we have pockets more in Aurelia area, uh, Hamilton, St. Catharines, Kitchener, Waterloo, Stratford. And are you owning this on your own or do you have a group of investors? Uh, a combination. Okay. So some stuff is strictly owned by, well, to be exceptionally technical, I don't own anything. So Robin owns <laughs> uh, a variety of properties by herself. She, she then owns uh, some with basically my accounting major, my main accounting partner, Peter, his wife. Uh, so, so we own some properties with them. And then I have two investor, two other investors uh, that we own a variety of our, more of our Aurelia properties and whatnot with. Okay. Um, I guess now I think about it, I got another part, two other partner groups, but I'm in minority positions with those. So are they typically uh, held in corporations? Everything I have is held in a corporation. Uh, last year, we set up a, a family trust as a result of tax changes, financing changes. So now that the family trust is there, it in turn owns uh, corporations which have the real estate. And then ultimately, uh, similar to a number of my clients, we are executing a five-year plan to transfer the remaining corporations into that family trust. So you're, sh- you're selling the shares to the family trust? I'll, I'll use the term transfer. Transferring? Yes. Okay, yes, transferring. Why don't we dig into that? Because if that's valuable for our listeners, um, I'm not familiar with, I've heard of the concept but I am not familiar with how they work. So uh, do you uh, have like a layman's explanation you can you can give us here? I, in terms of the family trust? Yeah, and how, how it benefits? Yeah, yeah. So I like to describe the family trust as, it, it's, if you will, this entity that allows in a stereotypical scenario, mom and dad to control assets, to control income, but not to own anything. And, and I'm, not, I'm certainly not using the correct technical terms here, but just in practice what happens. And so now there's some different benefits to that. And and, and having that family trust own a corporation, which in turn owns my real estate. um, Again, I'm not a lawyer by any means, but I understand there's some creditor protection available in many cases, not all, I'm sure, where if, for example, I'm involved, um, I I ran you over, Andrew, and now your estate's going to come, going to sue me for a gazillion dollars. If... I own my property personally. If I own shares of a corporation, presumably that now belongs to your estate. Right. Whereas if, on the other hand, everything's owned by a family trust, the trustees, two of which are my wife and I, are going to politely explain to your estate, we're sorry to hear about your loss, but George wasn't going to get any of these assets. It was going to Robin, the kids, the grandkids, the neighbor's dog, whatever it is. So they all they were all earmarked for something and, and I, we don't need to earmark them but we, yeah. we, we have effectively when the trust is created the the settler if you will will have established these are the following people that are eligible to receive assets okay. they're not required so no one owns the trust there are just people who are eligible to be beneficiaries that is correct okay and, and so that's so then no money comes money. out then so everything in the company stays in then it, it can 
but it, I also have then the opportunity because then I will also have, I have what they call capital beneficiaries and income beneficiaries. Most of the time they're going to be identical, okay. but in theory I could separate the two. But as an income beneficiary, I'm entitled to profit. Sorry, I'm not entitled. I'm eligible to receive profits if the trustees decide they're going to distribute those profits. And if the board of directors of the corporation, which in most family businesses means mom and dad, decide that they're going to pay a dividend. Okay. So say the dividend happens, you get income that year because you're one of the beneficiaries for income. Uh, At a personal tax standpoint, is there any benefit to having that income coming from a trust uh, or is it it no different? Is it just treated as income? It's going to be treated as income. So a trust provides what we call a a flow-through ability. So it's going to be still treated as a dividend from the corporation. Okay. So you get a dividend tax tax credit. Exactly. Exactly. So, so that's nice. It's also nice if I can sell the shares of a corporation. If I qualify, I, m- I might have, roughly speaking, $850,000 per shareholder available, tax-free. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, it doesn't always, apl- it doesn't usually apply for real estate investors that are starting off, but as they have increased portfolios, it certainly could apply at some point in the future or part of ultimate estate succession planning. Yeah. The the other more, I mean, I give the example of the auto accident, which is perhaps not the greatest of examples, but it's fairly dramatic. A much more practical example is to say, most likely, mom and dad are going to pass away at some point in time. Mm -hmm. If I own those assets personally, again, when the second passes away in a typical scenario, their assets are deemed to have been sold for fair market value for tax purposes as an exceptionally rough number. On average, for a, a good size portfolio, the, basically 25% of the assets are going to go to the government. Whereas in a family trust, I didn't own any assets. And so the trust the trust survives even if somebody the, the who's a best of beneficiary dies. It, it, exactly. So now all of a sudden, in theory, I have the ability to pass along all those assets without paying tax. Now, it's never going to be, I shouldn't say never, it's highly unlikely to be zero there's going to be some taxes I'm, let's not pretend otherwise but it's going to be a lot closer to zero than 25 percent yeah and, and how valuable is that if somebody's listening here you know thinking about thinking about what to do you know in the long run how to set up and they they want to be able to pass things to their kids one day without that tax implication and with the trust what i can i've got three kids as an example or i've got 18 kids it doesn't really matter but When they're young, I don't know necessarily who's going to be really interested in real estate. Maybe somebody's interested in a side business I have. Somebody has no capability of being involved. But I can very tax efficiently pass those assets to them when done correctly without paying tax. And they're they're the proud new owner of that business. And maybe I want to decide later on which of the kids should be involved or how do I divide things? Today, I may not know. My kids may be pretty young. Mm -hmm. Uh, As they mature, I have a better idea. I still want to treat my kids fairly, but fairly doesn't necessarily mean equally. Right, right. And I may have other assets that are are non-real estate oriented, maybe some insurance, maybe some a, a liquid portfolio to a degree, or I've got a bunch of second mortgages. I've got some land development partnership units, whatever it may be. I don't want to have to try and figure that out today. I want to reserve time because life changes. So at any point in time, you can change the direction of flow of funds out of a out of a family trust. Properly done, yes. Properly done. Okay, so and you're the guy that would know how to how to properly do it. Very very in very com- much so. combination with a lawyer. I'm, I'm guessing uh, uh, lawyers are critical to the yeah. process. Okay, yeah. So I uh, think I've noticed that you know when you're in real estate, your your lawyer and your accountant have to work yes. you know closely they, they together, do. incorporating companies. This you know this and that. Uh, you you definitely need to make sure uh, you're you're speaking with experts. Yes. Okay. So very good. Um, so like I said, what I've done is I've uh, basically opened this up that people can send me some questions. I had somebody specifically ask me um, about holding real estate personally versus in a corporation, uh, deducting capital cost allowance. Uh, and then the ta- tax implications that are there. Um, this is something you and I know we've we've spoken about. So um, I'm sure you have a very good response for this. Should we own in a company or should we own personally, aside from this whole family trust um, conversation? It, completely independent of the family trust. Roughly speaking, I would suggest I recommend the use of a corporation about 80% of the time. I, I don't keep accurate statistics to that, but just as a rough number. So it's certainly not all of the time, no, no doubt about it. But the majority of instances, I do find it more beneficial. 
Uh, if nothing else, I have still more ability to decide later on who gets what portion of the profits, again, when properly designed. I, it's a lot easier to add in investors, subtract investors. I, I, certainly on the finance side, once you get to a certain point, much easier through the corporations. Yes. There's there's so many things with that corporation and forgetting the, the more perhaps obvious part, non-tax related, but what are the legal implications? Uh, again, we, we touched on financing, just organization. What, uh, how professional do I look in dealing with other investors, for example? So I, I can have the ability to decide how I'm going to get paid. So it might be a, through a dividend, it might be through a bonus, a wage, a temporary loan. I have those choices, whereas if I own things personally, I, I've effectively handcuffed myself. Not that that's necessarily horrible. I mean, if I'm still profitable, I mean, yeah. it's better than nothing for sure. But in most cases, I had such an opportunity to, to save more taxes, be more efficient, pass more assets along to the next generation or to the church, the cancer society, whatever yeah. it is that's important to people. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, just to, to dig into this a bit deeper. So some of the implications that I know I've thought about are the fact that I pay at a personal income tax bracket if I own the property personally. However, in the corporation, I'm going to be at roughly 50% because it's considered passive income. There are some ways around that, but generally speaking, for most people, that's going to be the case. Sort of. Sort of. And, and so where I like to, to jump into that part, and that's certainly kind of the tax 101, no, no doubt about it, maybe tax 102. Um, but um, the, the problem with that 50-ish percent number is of that 30%, and I'm just using, again, rough numbers here. Uh, it, this will slightly depend on the province and a variety of different things. But 30% of that 50% is refundable. So my net corporate tax is 20%. And then if I contrast that, most investors, and there's certainly exceptions, they're going to be around about a 40-ish, 50% tax bracket personally. So if we can get them to effectively a 20% tax bracket, ultimately in that corporation, wonderful. If I use a slightly different example, so say somebody's roughly in a 50% personal tax bracket, they pay that money to the government, that money's gone forever. They're never going to see a cent of that again. Whereas in the corporation, I'm accumulating that 30% the refundable taxes that are available. So you're basically getting a company tax credit. Correct. That it comes back to you once I pay a dividend. When you pay a dividend, yeah. And, and I may pay the dividend to myself. I may pay it to a spouse, somebody else. There, there are certainly some rules and, and, and restrictions in terms of how I can play there. But maybe I'm going to be able to wait instead of paying out to me now when I've got a great job, whatever that may be. I'm waiting until I go into semi retirement, full retirement. Maybe I'm unemployed, such as my, I consider myself unemployed in that. I work for my own company, and so I can take money from my accounting firm, or I can take money from my real estate firm. And if I take money from the real estate, I'm driving down the tax there. For the accounting firm, it was active income. And so again, depending on the province, my income level, other investments, my tax rate's gonna be somewhere between 10 and Ontario, say 26.5%. Well, obviously I wanna tackle the, 20, or the 50% to bring it down to 20% before I take my active income. Yeah. And so just leaving some of those doors open allows me to have so much more tax savings or my worst case scenario is I'm forever going to be wealthy. I, I'm never in a low tax bracket. None of my family will ever be in a low tax bracket. I'm continuing to accumulate this refundable tax in the corporation. And then I say, hey, Andrew, why don't I sell you this portfolio of companies, but I'm going to have you buy the shares. By the way, there's $10 million refundable taxes there. I want half of that. So then you can increase your price and then you get paid handsomely for the uh, for the shares. And I and I never had that opportunity if I did it personally. I think the where we need to go with this answer, because I mean, I'm following, but I've asked you this before. <laughs> if for anyone who's not following that, basically what he's saying is there's options. It's not it's not a simple 50 percent in the corp. Uh, there is a way to get that money back, which there isn't personally, as you've said. And then when you pay dividends out of a corp to yourself, uh, any taxes paid in the corporation, I don't know if it's an exact translation, but you get a credit personally as if you had paid some of those taxes personally already. So it, it decreases the amount of taxes you'd have to pay personally. Yes. And it can be, by the time the math works out, I mean, it might not be to somebody's advantage to do it that way, yeah. but it can be. So as a quick example, 
roughly speaking, if I have no other source of personal income, I pay myself $40,000 from the corporation, I'm going to pay less than $2,000 in personal taxes. Yeah. I'm going to call that tax-free. Yeah, there is a scenario. That's the beautiful thing with a corp. There is a scenario where you can basically be tax-free up to around 40 to 60 yeah, grand. Right. Something. Exactly. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that the next $1,000 is a draconian tax rate. It just means, hey, there's some planning to be done. Yes. Yeah. So key thing here, work with a professional work. You know, I'm sure, George, if, if you're in the area, George would be happy to help you. But uh, I mean, if you already have an accountant, make sure you're, t you're talking to them about this and making them part of your planning, uh, because yeah, it, can, it can be very costly or extremely beneficial, depending on how you tackle it. It, it is. And it may vary year to year, which, again, is nice with the corporation, because now I have choices. Yeah. OK, so uh, one of the things that we didn't touch on there out of that question is is the capital cost allowance. And for those who aren't familiar with that, what that is, uh, basically, that's your you're amortizing the value of the building. So you're writing off or depreciating your building. And because you're depreciating it, they, they let that offset your income and it actually lowers your taxes in the corporation. So, it, you know, my concern was, well, if I'm in the court paying 50 percent tax, where's my cash flow? I mean, that's going to be all eaten up. Well, no, not necessarily because we can write off some of that value. I, we can write off that uh, CCA, and if, if I was to do things personally, I'm restricted in the sense that I can only use depreciation to the extent I have rental profit, so I can't increase a loss or create a loss, whereas in a corporation, in most cases, I'm going to be able to create losses. Okay. So my first few years, for example, I may not be as profitable from an income tax perspective, particularly if I'm fixing up the properties, getting the right tenant mix in, et cetera, et cetera. If I can accumulate, let's say I accumulated $100,000 in losses, which I couldn't use on the personal side, the corporation, I built that up. Now, all of a sudden, the following year, maybe I sell one of the properties for whatever reason, or I have some other form of large influx of taxable income. I've now got the ability to defer at least a portion of the tax onto that because I've accumulated some reserves. Yeah. So you can you can carry forward some losses and, and use those effectively in there. OK, there's that. Um, another question that I got here inside of the same question was, is there any implication for somebody who is uh, a non-resident of Canada owning a corporation? You know, can they do that? Um, I guess that. From my experience, I believe they are going to have to file in Canada if they're owning Canadian real estate. Most definitely, regardless of they use a corporation or they personally own the real estate, for example, there is going to be a tax return that's filed, no question. The, the corporation we tend to find may not always be the optimal tax um, vehicle to use, but it's often the far superior vehicle to use because it simplifies things. So as an example, if I were, and we have quite a number of non-resident, like, I mean, my clients literally are across the world. So I, even like my main office, if you will, is in the Waterloo region, probably only 10, 15% of my clients are there. They're scattered across the country. So you have non-resident. Uh, quite a number of non-residents, uh, non-Canadians in many non -Canadians. cases that are investing in Canadian real estate. So where they invest personally, uh, without getting to all the details, essentially the government of Canada is going to say, hey, you've owned this Canadian property. We're going to charge you 25% tax on your rental income, sorry, gross rental income, not after expenses. Wow, that's touch and go. Whereas if you fill out some other paperwork, we can tax you just on your net income with some adjustments. So there's okay, a structure. That's more reasonable. But I still have to be doing that on a monthly basis, essentially. And basically, I'm prepaying my tax through the year. My tenant, whether they know it or not, is actually responsible for that. As well, if I go to sell the property, I have to get permission. So many people will perhaps blindly look at, if you will, that purchase and sale agreement is going to have a clause in there, something to the effect of, uh, I am or am not a resident of Canada. And so then the implication is that if I'm a non-resident, as the purchaser, I'm responsible for withholding the taxes for that non-resident. If I do not withhold the taxes, in other words, give the money to Revenue Canada, that and that number might be different on, in different scenarios, but it can be 50% of the value of the property. If I don't do it and the non-resident doesn't pay the tax, Revenue Canada is coming after me. So as the purchaser, I want that to be correct. I, I want to do a little due diligence to make sure somebody just didn't lie to me um because i'm going to be held responsible unless i can show some due diligence wow this is incredible so you're saying if i sign a, a purchase and sale agreement and buy from a non-canadian 
here in Canada then and they don't pay their taxes, I could be liable to pay their taxes. Yes, that's correct. Wow. Well, that's shocking and something I've never checked for. And, and so now take the scenario with the corporation. So if that corporation was created in Canada, it's now a that corporation is a Canadian resident, if you will. Gotcha. Now I'm not required for, to do this withholding. I'm not required to worry about the purchase and sale. And by the way, when I ask for, usually what will happen is this default calculation on the withholding tax when I sell a property is significantly higher than what the real tax is going to be. And it's Revenue Canada's way of encouraging somebody to file a tax return and get some money back. Um, but if I didn't have to even go through that process, and I have an opportunity to file, I guess I have to file a certain form within 10 days of selling the property as the non-resident. That's if you own it personally? or If I own it personally. Okay, yeah. Uh, or it's a non-resident biz corporation, for example, that owns the property. Um, the problem is, and that paperwork will simply say, here's our quick calculation of what we think the withholding tax should be. Do we have your permission to withhold that instead of the higher number? Which is particularly of concern because if I have to hold 50% back, and I've got a 75% mortgage on that property. It means I'm about 25%. I, I, I could be at a real cash bind. Wow. Okay. So yeah, you could you could have to. That could be could, a huge problem. Right? You could have to find a lot of money just to pay Correct. it. So so you're saying you know for a for a non Canadian or a non resident Canadian uh, thinking about buying real estate, it sounds like a corp has some pretty huge advantages. I, I can just get around a lot of hassles, yeah. and, and more maybe more importantly, Andrew is yeah. you and I asked to somebody else that's a non resident to, to invest with us. And, and now we're going to probably turn away that person if we have to say, you're going to have to do this, 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 and this, yeah. or we can set up a corporation. Wouldn't this be a whole lot easier? Yeah. Okay. And then they would just have maybe some withholding on their dividends. Some, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. okay. So that, that does sound a lot simpler. And wow, you just like enlightened me to a lot of stuff I hadn't thought about. But, you know, I'm, I'm used to thinking like investing in the States because I've done that and you know, what's, what's involved there. And then, you know, coming back the other way. Um, you know, a lot of what they do that direction makes sense it, now too. It, it, right. It, it's really okay. a reversal. It's just a reversal. Okay. So let's see if we have any other questions here. Um, what additional write-offs can you do if you own land in another country? Um, example, could I write off flights to and hotel costs? This is going to be one of those, it depends. Yeah. It, and so when there's raw land, it's typically thought of as, wait a minute, is this going to be like a parking lot that we're able to get some revenues off of, some spare revenues, for example, because we're renting it to a farmer to, to, to harvest something, or we're simply waiting to be able to do something in terms of a construction project. And where we're more waiting and we don't have enough revenues, then Revenue Canada is going from the Canadian perspective. So I can't speak to the foreign country because they'll all have their own rules. Yeah. But Revenue Canada is keenly interested in, as a resident of Canada, whether I'm a corporation or an individual, what I'm doing in other countries. And so then, the, if, if you will, kind of apply, Canadianize those rules. And in most cases, maybe I'm going to have to capitalize something. In other words, uh, add it to the cost base of a property so that yeah. when I ultimately sell it, then I can do something with yeah. that. But in, in terms of the airplane flights, for example, really, was that necessary or or Revenue Canada may take the position, okay, maybe they can buy the idea that you needed to go and check things out once. But the land probably wasn't going to go very far on you for the next three years. So if you're saying it's in Hawaii. Every hey, year I got to check it out. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there's got to be a certain reality. There. Yeah. So you got you to uh, take a reasonable approach there. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Common sense, I think, would, would have to prevail. For the there. most part. Yeah. Okay. Very, very good. You know what I want to jump into because a lot of people are asking about the 50% tax in corporations. We seem to be getting a, a, a lot of people are concerned about that. So it's yes. a good thing we uh, we covered that one because that to me, that was one of the big ones. And like I was constantly at this. I want to own a corporation for the mortgage benefits because I think they're huge. Yes. I think the growth potential is huge. It's like kind of like going from elementary school into high school. Uh, and that, that, that's a great way of phrasing it. <laughs> yeah. You, know, you start in elementary school, you learn the basics, you know, you do it in your personal name and then you realize, OK, it's time, time to take this to the next level. So. Um, that's that's generally what uh, what's being asked here. A lot of the, the comments I'm getting. What I wanted to dive into real quick is because Airbnb is still a hot topic right now. A lot of rules changing. Um, the tax law on it is probably in the the junior stages still uh, right now as uh, CRA figures out what to do with it. Um, here in Canada, there's the HST um, issue, not just that you need to charge it, but when you're doing short term rentals, uh, that's now sort of looked at as a commercial asset. 
Right. Yes. And again, here, the luxury at BDO is I have a GST and HST partner that deals with all of these issues. And, oh, and yeah. we're keeping him humming because yeah. as our clients are getting into these, as you indicated, there's different issues in terms of when do I, often the issue is not necessarily so much at the beginning of the process, I bought the property. It's actually, I decided to convert the property to personal use or long-term residential. Oops, do I have to now charge myself GST and HST on that property, or if I'm selling to an arm's length person, do I need to charge them GST or HST? And that was not often something they were thinking about. They're uh, often the purchasers going to understand on a new property. Yes, I'm going to pay the GST and HST. May or may not have uh, the GST rebate. If it's Ontario, I'm going to get at least an HST rebate for a portion. But it can hit somebody sideways with respect to I didn't know I had to pay GST or HST on the property or again, the self assessments. And so to me, before I go ahead and buy that property, I want my clients to be cognizant of what the implications are, or they decide to get more probably what I'll see frequently is that change in use yeah. of the property. Let's just be aware of where, where we stand. Um, yeah. So, so to simplify this, uh, for our, our listeners and viewers, um, the HST element here is, is really a question of like, say you own a $300,000 property. Well, how would you feel if you just didn't quite understand exactly what your use was? And all of a sudden CRA says, oh, you actually owe $39,000 in HST because it's worth $300,000 and that's 13%. You changed use from commercial back to residential. So please send us $40,000. Right. Uh, that is not a conversation or a letter that you ever want to receive. Particularly two or three years later when they're out just going to add some interest charges and perhaps yeah. say, wait a minute, there's gross negligence here. You willfully defrauded the government. Yeah. And by the way, now that's 50% of the taxes. George, is there, a, is there an easy, well, I suppose no answer is easy here, but is, is there um, a way that you can kind of put this to us that will reduce that risk or, or how should people be proceeding uh, uh, knowing that this is a risk? Yeah, it, it, it is a risk. There's no doubt in my mind it's a risk. It doesn't mean don't do it. It just means address it up front and make sure you're cognizant of it. So to me, when you are getting ready to buy a property or change the use of one of your existing properties, it's talking with your advisor to make sure you've got not just the implication today, but what's the final implication. So you have the really an understanding of what will happen over the life cycle of that property. Now, I've heard I've heard uh, people say this a few times, and I think we even spoke about it. And I, I don't really understand how it works. And maybe I'll leave today with that same thing. But that's OK. Uh, as long as I, I don't need to know how electricity works to turn on the light. Um, right. <laughs> so if uh, if I buy the property, so say I buy that three hundred thousand dollar house or condo unit and it's just a residential property, it was owned by another residential home homeowner. And then I decide, okay, I want to Airbnb this. Uh, I go full-time Airbnb. Um, is there something I can do to notify the government, hey, this is a real a residential unit. Already HST has been paid at one point. Um, I don't want to pay it again. So now I'm going to convert it into commercial use, but I'll convert it back into residential use um, while I, I still own it before I would ever sell it. Making a, um, a quick answer to that is to say, I've now much more respected my GST and HST group in the sense of little nuances seem to change the answer. And so I don't want to hazard a guess to that. I, I would defer to my partner there and okay. his team. Uh, but what we have is, and it's not like I'm a complete lay person, of course, mm -hmm. but realize how intricate some of those rules are. And, and again, I, I, every time there's a GST or HST question, Peter and myself, yeah. we just, we, we we, defer. I, I copy Scott onto the email yeah. and say, Scott or, or Nicole, one of his uh, team members, can you please just confirm this is what I think is going to happen? Yeah. Please say yes or no, or let the, our client know where I'm wrong. Or okay. I'm so simple, uh, a simple answer here would be that, that you've heard that there are ways of, around it or, or you have not heard that there are ways around there, it. There are ways in certain circumstances, typically yeah. when speaking, when you're going to change the use from residential to commercial, yes, that you quote unquote have to charge GST or HST, but you get it back because of the ITC rules. Mm -hmm. but, uh, okay. That's great. Now, when I go to convert it back to something now, 
when do I have to pay that GST or HST? Is there an ability to stretch it? Is it immediate? And, and, and my perception is there's different rules for different scenarios. Uh, now, Scott or Nicole could jump on yeah. the next moment and say, no, George, you're a moron. This is really how it works. But my concern is I've seen clients get themselves into situations where they did owe money yeah. and they still had the property or they sold it and they were not expecting to uh, have to chunk out a, uh, basically that money because they may not have even thought about it yeah. until they were in the lawyer's office signing the paperwork. I will say that, you know, these are relatively high level questions that I don't believe most people are thinking about at all. Very infrequently. It, it's more, I, I like having Scott around with some of our presentations, for example, because he'll have some examples of scenarios where people were caught off guard and then people realize, oh my goodness, that could have been me. Yeah. And particularly if we're talking to, we often speak to groups of realtors as an example. And now all of a sudden it's something for them to say, oh, wait a minute, I do need to talk to my client regarding this or that, whether the purchaser or the vendor, yeah. and just to be cognizant of what's going on. It just really, really uh, goes back to work with professionals because I, I can't imagine having to try and figure out the answer to that on myself. Like, I mean, really, it would just be analysis paralysis and don't do anything. And again, I, I consider myself exceptionally skilled with income taxes. Yeah. GST or HST, it should be really simple, right? I mean, it's a, a flat tax for the most part. But it's it's so nuanced that uh, that's why we have a department that that's all they do. And for them, it's really, really fast. They know what to ask for, yeah. what they're they're professionals at the end of the day. And it may only take them five or ten minutes. But wow, that was five or ten minutes. That was a whole lot better to know up front as compared to after the fact. OK, um, let's see if you've got any other uh, other questions here. Um, and just yeah, one thing I will say, like that has actually stopped me from from wanting to pursue Airbnb, just knowing that that was a, a risk. Or even a possibility. The second that that was thrown out there, I'm like, I'm pretty good with my regular rentals. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, not everyone's like that. Um, <laughs> Scott says, tell him to inform your listeners that all investors should be on QuickBooks Online. Um, Scott works for QuickBooks, so ah, I see. I think to, to be honest with the, I'm I'm more of a it's still a desktop person as compared oh, yeah. to the online version. No offense, Scott. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the trouble I have, and Scott may correct me here, yeah. um, but as, as we deal with our rep and whatnot, but one of my problems, for example, is by time I've got like ten or fifteen corporations. I have family trusts. I have my personal affairs. Yeah. I then have my uh, several committees with my church, different charities. So I have say twenty five different entities that need bookkeeping. Yes. I don't want to pay a separate fee for each one of those. I feel you. I feel the same way. So I have three ongoing fees and then they just increased it. And it's not just getting increased once. It's getting increased three times. Right. Yeah. And so now I love the desktop, the desktop version of QuickBooks. I, I absolutely love it. I've been using it since day one um, and I find it very intuitive to use. It's fantastic in my opinion. Uh, we kind of get around the, the online aspect by putting it on Dropbox and I've got access to it. Oh, so you just have a folder on Dropbox. So if, Correct. If, oh, that's that's kind of brilliant. It, it, it's almost brilliant. <laughs> uh, the, the the disadvantage of doing that, the, the huge advantage the online version has that the Dropbox doesn't have is if, for example, Robin and I are doing something in the same file at the same time, yeah. we've just created a problem. You just created um, a problem, yeah. So you'd uh, have to notify people, I'm working on this, don't touch exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, or sometimes if your computer's smart enough, it'll detect that somebody else is using it and it'll let you know. And maybe the user, in my case, not smart enough to know that, but yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there, and there's probably other solutions out there, but in a very simplistic way, that's what we do. Now, I'm going to put this back to you because you hear a lot of questions. What what question do you feel like is most on the investor's mind that we haven't covered today? Uh, maybe two. So one in terms of, so we've talked about that 50% tax rate if it's passive income, but not everybody's investing always passively. So we may be investing in rent to owns. So we may have, um, we may be flipping properties. And, and so now all of a sudden, uh, development pro projects as well, where I'm going to be considered in a, at least in part, an active income level, again, depending on my province. Now, perhaps my real estate deals, I might be paying effectively 12 and a half percent today. I might be paying 18%. I might be paying 26 and a half percent. Similar numbers across the province, plus or minus a couple of points in most cases. So I may not even always be in that 50% tax bracket area. And so again, there's opportunities then using corporations to be considering, well, how should I be allocating my portfolio out? 
uh, what should I be investing in through RSPs, TFSAs, corporation? Again, I, I very rarely do I recommend on the personal side, but I may also be grouping those assets into different corporations. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's kind of one area that we, we really like to get involved with with our clients. And other common question we get is, what do I do with my automobile uh, for, for deductions there? Uh, should I buy? Should I lease? Should I buy or lease through the corporation? Should I do it personally? And there's going to be a different, there's actually fairly complex formulas, in my opinion, for determining the actual deduction. So if you walk into the sales dealership, this they usually give you, based on my experiences, one part of the formula that makes it sound like you should do what they're looking for. Um, but they forget the other aspects of it. I find most people are generally speaking better off owning the vehicle personally, assuming that they don't insist on having a new vehicle every two, three years, for example. Uh, but if I've got a, an older pickup, for example, or a van that's clearly for work purposes and the exceptional vast majority of the time it's strictly business, sure, the, the my answer changes or the amount of kilometers that I put on the vehicle can help change my answer. But the again, to me, it's worth a five, 10 minute conversation with your advisor to say, before I go off and do whatever I'm going to do with the vehicle, how do I make sure I get the most bang for my buck without going through a 14 week analysis using all the formulas? Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. That's something I've worried, you know, wondered about too. And nothing seems simple about, about tracking uh, vehicle expenses either. No, no. And it's an easy target for Revenue Canada too. They, they know that the vast majority of people do not keep an automobile log to track their business versus personal kilometers. Uh, so it's easy pickings for them. Yeah. That's not really fun or nice. No, it, 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 it's one of the most prevalent targets though. Okay. So just double check here. Um, Best structure for a newbie. I think we sort of sort of covered that. Um, you know, maybe if I could add to that is we'll, we'll get the question of well, when should I start talking to an advisor? When should I set up a corporation? If I'm just getting going, do I really need the company? And so my answer to that will be more: Where do you think you're going to be in three to five years' time? So that if you're going to buy one or two small hundred thousand dollar properties, that's it for the rest of your life. I mean, I say congratulations. You're better off than the vast majority of Canadians, but you don't need a corporation from a tax perspective. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're expecting to, to buy 10 properties over the next five years, yeah. uh, then wait a minute, if I buy the first three or four personally and then start using the corporation, presumably I'm going to have to transfer those properties because I'm going to have financing issues. It probably wasn't what I was looking yeah. for from a legal perspective, probably wasn't what I was looking for from a tax perspective. Now I've got all these transfer costs of the property to the corporation, yeah. which I could have avoided in the first place if I set it up right the first time. And yes, first year or two, maybe the corporation is underutilized, yeah. but that's still going to be far cheaper than in most cases doing all the transfers after the fact. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cost wise, like I've been considering transferring things over to the corporation and knowing, you know, land transfer tax implications, what those could be and the, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands by the time I do it all. Um, you know, would have been a lot cheaper to just pay your, your, you know, annual filing fees. And that's right. And, uh, you know, maybe just so people understand what the implications to owning a corporation are. I mean, for one, your book's got to be, got to be well tracked, uh, two, you've got annual filings and, you know, what right. should, what should people be budgeting if they're going to own a corporation? So, so if they have a corporation, then again, is, is a real rough number, assuming what I'm going to call reasonable bookkeeping, they're going to be paying in the neighborhood of $2,000 a year for tax returns, financial statements, uh, more of our clients, they also want some planning. They're, they're going to set aside some money just to, yeah, let's let's do some planning here. Uh, and I like to be able to say to people that given a reasonable period of time, if you've got a good invest, uh, a good advisor, if they can't save you three times plus that what you pay, I mean, you hired the wrong person. And I'll tell my clients, fire me if I can't do that. I'm not doing my job at that point. Now, clearly if somebody is losing money for five years in a row, I mean, you don't have to be much of an accountant to figure out zero times whatever tax rates can be awfully close to zero, but give me some meat and potatoes and we can help reduce risk long term, medium term, yeah. uh, working with your legal team, with the finance team, etc. That's where there's more and more value to that. Uh, and, and then we'll get the comment. Well, if it costs two thousand dollars to do your kind of your basics there, then if I got this property, I mean, that takes out some money from, of course, the operating budget. And then rightly or wrongly, my comment would be, 
if you can't afford $2,000 and you bought a million dollar property, do you really think you can afford a million dollar property? <laughs> yeah, well said, well said. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, like I kind of, you know, I hate the, the comment that I need need to incorporate a new company because, you know, it's an extra QuickBooks, it's an extra, it's, you know, file, you know, the bookkeep. So yeah, obviously be diligent, make smart decisions, talk with your advisor, make sure you're, you're only incorporating what you need and you actually have a reason to incorporate it. Right. To, to me, if you set up a, a scalable structure so that it can grow with you when you need it to, it can shrink when you need it to, uh, that's fantastic. But you certainly don't need to start off with a, in most cases, a big fancy dancy structure. It can grow with you as time progresses. Awesome. Yes, I will reiterate from experience, talk to the professional early, don't wait, just just do it and, and get proper bookkeeping. Make sure you're doing that proper. Uh, you just don't want the headaches that come with it if you don't, so. No, it's not worth the extra stress, particularly if you're using co-investors. You don't want to hand them off and say, oops, I got to change that. I know you already filed your tax return. Um, it's not exactly credibility lifting. Yeah. Okay, so George, uh, just uh, if anyone would like to reach out to you, um, follow you, um, you know, where should we send them? Best way of getting a hold of me is usually through email, uh, gdube, g-d-u-b-e at bdo.ca. And uh, while I'm not perfect with email, admittedly, I've got a couple of assistants that help out. And certainly with uh, people inquiring, they can usually a little more quicker than myself kind of get to sure. start helping people out so we can schedule a, a planning meeting with yeah. uh, with myself. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of people who want to talk to you. And hoping so. Yeah. Yeah, well, you've got uh, you've got the experience as an investor. To me, like that's that's super appealing. You know, especially as a podcast guest, just somebody who can speak <laughs> as, hey, I actually do this, right? You know, and I'm I'm a big on that, right? Like, you know, practice what you preach, and it's great when, hey, this is how I do it for me. Well, hey, that makes sense if you're doing it that way. That's, uh, you know, that's more incentive for me to do it that way. Um, okay, George, uh, anything else you'd like to you'd like to leave our uh, listeners and viewers with before we wrap up? To me, the big thing is get the right structure into place. Talk with your advisors, not just the tax advisors. But once you have that structure in place, don't think that that's the final structure. The rules change, financing rules change, legal rules change. You, to me, having that annual meeting at the very least with your advisors is incredibly valuable. Oh, and I just realized I forgot to ask you, and we'll do the short version of this. Storage units? Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> Please tell. I, I'm not sure what to tell there. It, again, it's... You have a couple hundred storage units. We, we have uh, a nice nice area of the storage units. We're, we're currently in process of negotiating to acquire some more and to expand to what we do have. It um, admittedly started more like a lot of things by accident, but it was our, our, it was our last acquisition, um, which had been just over a year ago, I guess. Okay, so you're fresh into this. We're, we're, we're fresh into it. it. It's it's doing well, financially speaking. Which area? Uh, this is what I'll call in the uh, Barry area. Okay. And we're, we're we're quite happy with it. It the, the the first year analysis they did, they they figured basically it had a quarter million dollar increase in value over the year. Thought wonderful. Is it cash positive for you? Cash positive. What do you figure the the value of the couple hundred units has? It, it's now about two million. So you got a two million dollar asset. We started around one point seven five. Then yes. Okay. And how many hundred units did you get? I don't remember the exact number to be honest with you. Approx. Yeah. yeah. So I'm saying it's a couple hundred. Yeah. There's outdoor, indoor. Okay, and it's self storage. Yeah. So they go in. So uh, I just love the concept of that because there's no landlord tenant rule. It, it, it's it's easier that way now. In fairness, my, uh, um, a couple of my partners there, or shareholders. They spent a lot of time doing the turnover and getting the new systems in place, automating more things. They've worked really incredibly hard at that. Quite honestly, I've never even set foot on the place. That's kind of and, a nice thing uh, to, it, to be I, able I to say. I need to do the drive and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But it, it, it's something where, yes, there, it's not that it's quote unquote easy. I, I, I would never suggest that. I, I see how much work is involved, mm -hmm. but it's by putting in the right systems and what have you, it, it can be a lot easier yeah. And I think you can really limit your, your legal expense to evicting people. It's like, you're not paying. Okay. <laughs> Here's your stuff right. on the curb. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and we have some specific yeah. rules that we have to follow there, but they're so much more lenient as compared yeah. to residential. Yeah. I've, I've been, I, I just, I was really keen on it because a friend of mine have spoke, we, we speak about this fairly regularly, regularly that we want to pick up some storage units, but we don't know who, who's selling. 
So, hey, if you're selling some storage units, I am interested in actually uh, looking at this. I'm sure George is too. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, George, thank you so much. Thank I'm you. sure our listeners and viewers love this. And if you didn't, guys, listen to it again because you missed something. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that was great. A, okay. a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks. We'll, we'll have to have you on again. Awesome. Thanks for watching today's episode. Just a friendly reminder to please rate and review this podcast on iTunes. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure that you smash the like and subscribe and notification bell. Uh, and also leave a comment. And hey, while you're at it, why not share this episode with somebody you think it could help? It helps this podcast grow and I would really appreciate it. Thanks again. We'll see you on the next episode. <laughs> <laughs>